we're all about charity here at Sex and Space. And today's shout out is for the amazing School of Sexuality Education. Check them out at schoolofsexed.org or as their guests on this very episode, keep listening to find out loads more. Sex, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the speculative interdimensional vehicle, Sex in Space. Its mission, to explore new points of view, to seek out fresh opinions, to boldly go where so many have gone before, and still somehow manage to totally miss the point. Subscribe to Sex in Space, wherever quality podcasts are found. Hello, I'm Tim. Welcome along to Sex and Space. Here we explore sex across all of its infinite dimensions. This is episode 11. We've got just one more to go in season one before we take a little itty bitty break. If this is your first time joining us, however, please do head on through our back catalogue. We've had some great interviews with some awesome guests. Richie Hardcore talking porn, masculinity and checking in with ex-lovers the wonderful Robin Salisbury on her journey into sex therapy and trying to get her mouth around the word penis. Dame, that's right, Dame Catherine Healy, legendary sex worker and activist who was blindsided by lube of all things, and the lovely Mark Fisher, talking about the world's first HIV-positive sperm bank and glad-wrapping people to tables, plus loads more. Now, we've mentioned it before, but we really do want your feedback. We love hearing from people who listen to the podcast, Renee flicked us an email at hello at sexandspace.com asking, and joking I hope, if 40-year-olds were too old to listen. Of course you are, bloody oldies. Nah, it's not true. We are very much all ages welcome. I'm actually 40 now myself and still despairingly underinformed, and learning, hopefully learning something new every day. Next season, we're actually going to be talking to Dr. Jane Fleischman. That's F L E I. S-H-M-A-N. It's going to be great. Check out her TED Talk as a little sweetener. It's called, Is It Okay for Grandma to Have Sex? It's awesome. Also, Renee, thanks and very grateful for the topic suggestion. Thanks also to Jenny for reaching out through the website, letting us know she was cooking along happily to Robin Salisbury. And thanks to Georgina for her kind words, the great work it sounds like you're doing, and for sharing this podcast as well. Of course, we always love a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, if you so desired, but more formally, we're putting out a call for feedback, as we would love to know more. We've set up a real quick and easy survey, which you can find on the link tree in our Insta bio over at sexinspace.com, that's sexinspace, D-O-T-C-O-M, or in the footer of our website at sexinspace.com. It'd be really great if you could find a spare minute to head over there and check that out. Many, many thanks. Now, for the interview we're sharing today, I was completely outnumbered and outgunned as I got to sit down, all of my little ownsome, with a very formidable double act, the lovely Dolly Pedalia and Dr. Emma Chan. Since recording this interview, though, their organisation has had a name change. They used to be called Sexplain, so you'll hear that pop up a couple of times during our chat. They are now called the School of Sexuality Education. Commit that to your memories. Dolly is Deputy CEO and COO of the School of Sexuality Education. They're out of the UK. And they're an organisation that offers inclusive and comprehensive sex education for the 21st century with workshops on porn, consent, sexting and healthy relationships. This takes place in schools, universities, youth groups and other centres of learning. As of this morning, and I checked, schoolofsexed.org, 37,358 young people have taken part in the School of Sexuality Education Section Relationships Education Workshops. Also joining us was Dr. Emma Chan, who is the School of Sexuality Education's Reproductive and Sexual Health Lead, and a doctor, and a blogger, and an activist, and she's studying for a Master's of Science in Sexual Health and Reproduction at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Her blog, squishsquashsquelch.com, is far more than just doodles on love, sex, genitalia and gender. It's really great, creative and informative. The doodles had me scrolling for days, 
and I've tried the recipe for the homemade Play-Doh. Let's get into it. Hope you enjoy. And now, the interview. So, um, welcome to Sex and Space. Um, Thanks for having me. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. It's a real, it's a real honour um, to put your trust in us. Um, so, yeah, wow. Sex, s- sexplain, sexplain for us, please. <laughs> Who yeah. wants to go? Take it away, <laughs> I assume you have a, a well rehearsed um, sort of well, elevator a great pitch. Introduction. <laughs> for this sort of thing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, as you said, uh, we provide uh, relationship and sex ed. We work mostly with schools, um, secondary schools, and um, typically uh, year seven, so about year eleven um, or eleven years okay. to about eighteen, sixth form. Um, and yeah, we cover kind of all everything um, sex and relationship education. Um, and we uh, kind of tend to do that most predominantly uh, through workshops and um, some assemblies and talks and things as well. Okay. Yeah, and our approach um, is is very intersectional feminist, uh, sex positive and non-binary. Yeah. And obviously, most importantly, I think uh, non-judgmental. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So it complements um, what existing sex education the children are potentially yeah. getting well is I that think, sort of the, was that the idea i think that's i think that was the idea i think it's a tricky one um because it really depends on the school mm. um it also depends i think on um the education that they've had kind of at home as well because yeah. i think all sre should really be um delivered holistically alongside the home and the rest of the school yeah um so, but you know, we have we do find that actually we'll work with a lot of young people that haven't had any sex education at all since primary school, and that was kind of basic biological reproduction, yeah. and that's kind of it. Um, we've also found that it can be quite inconsistent, or um, it can be possibly quite uh, victim blaming. Um, we've also, you know, come across a lot of instances where gender uh, diverse young people feel really um, excluded. Mm. Um, and that's kind of, you know, why inclusivity is so core cool to our approach. Yeah. Um, because obviously we want to make sure that every every young person and everyone that kind of works with young people have access to kind of comprehensive um, sex ed. Yeah, amazing. I mean, so it's a workshop based Yes, yeah, so that typically tends to be the most popular um, kind of way that we work with young people, just because we find that it's a really good way of um, opening up discussion around kind of particular topics, um, say consent or anatomy or virginity, for example, mm. and like really busting those myths. And um, and also, I think it just it gives us an opportunity to sort of um, work with young people in quite a sort of fun, informal way. Um, where they can ask questions and they don't feel like they're going to be judged. Yeah. Um, and it's a kind of a safe space for them to ask questions and, um, you know, get information in a way that's accurate and reliable. Um, yeah. I yeah. imagine it's a lot of fun too, right? Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> we Hopefully, try to make we it try fun. To yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We try to yeah. make things fun. I think that's yeah. one of the, the nice things about a kind of workshop format um, is that, you can get people involved and and just kind of and bouncing off their own ideas as well. So Dolly um, picked up on that a lot of the children that we work with have um, or can have very varying experiences. Um, they might have very mm. different relationships with the adults in their lives, um, with their peers, um, with how kind of confident they feel seeking information elsewhere. Um, and I think with workshops, it's possible because of the kind of interactive nature, it's it's possible to kind of pick up on on what they know and what they want to know and, and kind of get them to direct, direct things, which isn't really possible in more kind of like um, sort of prescribed kind of Sit, sit down here and here's a lecture. Exactly. Kind of lesson. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Here's the birds, here's the bees. <laughs> now, exactly. Go away and. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's quite amazing. Um, I, uh, to, be, to be honest, I mean, my experience of sex education, I, mean, I, I don't know how you define it really. You sort of touched on it. There's, there is formal mm. sex education, mm. and then there's everything else. And the formal, you know, there's the, there's your parents, mm. um, you know, there's your friends and peers and et cetera. And then there's kind of what you mm. find out through... The media porn. Well, yeah. exactly, the media yeah. porn. Um, yeah. 
trying various things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're up against it now, right? With here we are in 2019. I'm I'm looking back to my my sort of teen years in the late 90s, and it was hugely different. I would mm. imagine. Um, it's interesting to know that I've you know, that I've got this perspective now that, you know, you sort of, porn isn't real. That's not how it is. Mm. That's not how it should be or has to be or how you have to behave. But I imagine if you were 16 or even younger and you found that, you'd be like, oh, okay, this is what I should be doing. So I imagine it's problematic trying to unpick a few Mm. myths just on that, let alone, you know, what they may have been told or... Yeah, misinformed absolutely. in other ways. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I, I think it's, I think it's really important because uh, to have these conversations um, because we come across a lot of young people who don't necessarily, um, un, you know, don't have the critical tools to essentially unpack mm. the issues they see in porn. Um, so things like you know uh, body image and race and um, uh, consent and all of those things are so important to tackle and discuss in the classroom. Mm. And you know, like I said, give them empower young people and give them the critical tools to sort of be able to an- analyse the situation really pick it apart and that kind of applies to things like TV shows and films and things as well yeah um, yeah I think that's mm. I think um, sometimes it's not it's it can be difficult but not in the ways you expect it to um, so a lot of people worry that um, young people can't tell the difference between kind of like reality and porn but actually they're quite well versed and they're quite they understand the technology perhaps in a way that someone um so i think i must be mm. a similar age to you that, that doesn't so they're very for example um they'll probably all be using snapchat and they'll and instagram and they'll all be very comfortable with kind of filters and they understand that there's that kind of artifice and that sort of um like yeah artificialness in a very like very kind of they've had experience of, of using that technology technology yeah. and they understand it really really well um but i think perhaps just haven't really like so they have the kind of potential to do that and critique things but they perhaps haven't really been told like the way that they've often um consumed kind of porn is in a way where they don't really kind of see it in the same way way that way as kind of other things that they would see that they would apply those kind of critical tools to or kind of like actually yeah this is this isn't what i'm i know that images that, that are online aren't always um yeah, aren't, aren't, aren't always kind of faithful or real life, and why isn't is this the same? Is yeah, yeah. So, and is that, I mean, we could talk about porn for days, I imagine. <laughs> but um, does that does the problems that normally go hand in hand with that manifest quite apparently in the workshops stuff like that come around around body image and? Um, I think there are, there are varying responses. Some people, yeah. when you kind of say, oh. Um, think about porn what might not be real about it or why it might it might be different from real life um you can kind of see a light bulb turning on in mm. someone's face um and they'll be like oh yeah actually um that's probably not representative and i haven't seen people like me and you only ever see certain types of relationships and that you can see that you've just started a, a whole process um i think sometimes i think particularly with boys it can be quite they can be quite resist they can be quite resistant to um unpacking that because I think there's a lot I think because it starts off a whole big process of analysis I think they'd be quite resistant to that I think that can be challenging sometimes we, um, and yeah I think sometimes mm. people can be well what's the problem if people like that kind of sex mm. like what's what's the problem with that mm. and, and 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 absolutely that's yeah that's that that's a, a that's true for some people but I think it's about yeah whether I think some people can be more and less and or less receptive to the idea of kind of like cri- critically viewing what uh, porn mm. Mm. especially from a yeah it's, it's not just about their perspective or mm. what they enjoy it's the the problematic repercussions or yeah, like that. yeah. so away from porn for a minute <laughs> um consent mm. um and relationships mm. um all these things i mean it had just walked me through a if even possible walk me through a a sort of Workshop or how how one like the format of one how it, how it sort of takes place for you guys and is yeah is it um do they cover everything like is yeah. is that that's the plan the workshops cover all these topics or will people come along to a a 
porn workshop or a... So usually um, we'll work with schools to define what um, they need for the per year group. So gotcha. obviously all of the workshops are kind of hopefully built upon each year mm. um, so that they're age appropriate. Um, but we'll usually typically deliver kind of one topic. So for example, consent, healthy relationships. Um, and then maybe another session um, we'll do anatomy and pleasure, um, which also unpacks things like um, body image and hygiene and things like that. Um, so yeah, it really it depends. Um, I guess with consent, we I think it is really important to kind of define what consent is and look at the law. But I think it's important to kind of go beyond that and look at how consent works. Um, it's not just a yes or no, and how it's kind of specific. Looking at you know the definitions of sex um, and you know what kind of what someone might define as sex is completely different to someone else's definition of sex mm, yeah. and the impact that that then has on communication and um and again you know talking about these uh, and kind of terminology and understanding boundaries but then also looking at examples and scenarios where consent can be they can see consent being applied mm. Mm. i think that's really important because it helps sort of unpack all of these ideas that they have um and just see it in practice, I guess. Mm. I think we often, with, with consent, we often start um, with a kind of, the scenarios mm. are kind of like true, false, um, and, and get them thinking about um, specific, um, yeah, specific examples and trying to apply what they know. And that's kind of interesting, um, particularly with the true, false questions. We have mm. just a, a list of statements. Um, so things like any any kind of un, unwanted touching um um, it counts as sexual assault, and is that true or false? Um, and um, the one that kind of gets people a lot as well, if, if you, if you, or kind of gets people engaged quite a lot, um, is um, uh, if you continually pester someone for sex and they mm. eventually say yes, um, does that count as consent? And you kind of, is that true or false? Mm. And and kind of, you can really kind of elicit their ideas and get them to, yeah. It, it, and it's kind of interesting. There's often. Um, often different kind of age groups and different um, sort of gender mixes as well. We sometimes mm. work in um, I don't know, either boys' schools or girls' schools. Um, it can be quite interesting to see what their kind of varying opinions are and what the split in the classroom is as well. Um, so, yeah, you get very mm. different... Yeah, you can get very different... Um, you can get very different answers across um, a group of children within about sort of four or five years of each other and I think that's quite interesting mm. yeah. and sort of just lead on from there. Is there anything that um, has sort of surprised you about about their their knowledge or anything that you kind of weren't weren't expecting? Mm. Um, I think just um, a lot of young people's ability to pick up on things and um, you think that they're not yeah to, to pick up on messages so um, for example the uh, this earlier this week we were in a, a girls' school um, just outside of London, and um, we were doing an anatomy workshop. So we um, we get the children to build Play-Doh models of, of various types of genitals and yeah. use that to, as a kind of starting point for talking about um, sex or puberty and kind of um, uh, just kind of health, like personal hygiene and health. Um, and I mentioned kind of intersex genitals, so people that have um, uh, sexual characteristics that aren't. Uh, that aren't clearly kind of on a binary of kind of either penis and mm. uh, testicles or, or vulvas, um, and one of the and I, I asked them what they thought that meant, and one of them really specifically talked about Casta Semenya, which is a really mm. interesting um, example. So for people who don't know, uh, she's an ath, she's a, a, a cis uh, woman athlete um, who uh, who. Um, uh, is a is a runner, um, I think middle distance runner. Possibly, <laughs> <laughs> not a very big sports person. Um, but she has been challenged by the International Olympic Committee um, because she has very high levels of testosterone, which hasn't really, uh, which is a kind of <laughs> new characteristic, like new kind of sexual characteristic of things that make you not not a woman. Mm. Um, and and this child had knew about that and brought that up. And like I kind of my first instinct was say, oh, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm kind of, but actually, no, that is kind mm. of exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this kind of spectrum um, of kind of sexual characteristics and and um, yeah and this person probably does have a, a, a vulva and a womb but actually yeah you're you're that's quite a nuanced point to make and yeah. um, she, she absolutely had picked up on this child had absolutely picked up on that and I yeah I think I think that's what continually surprises me is what kind of children and young adults do pick up on mm. and are receptive mm. to in the messages around them. Yeah, because 
blimey, that was a tough message to get from the news coverage <laughs> on that story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Loads of uh, pictures, is, is she a man? Or, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, mm. some really horrible stuff. Um, mm. A very polarising issue, that one, mm. um, for a lot of people. Um, that... Um, um, when you say polarizing, what 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 do you mean by that? Oh, I, I think it just discussions that I've that I've heard people had um, was around the, um, the had the fairness of her competing against other women. Sure. Um, and I think some people had a had a problem with her competing. Um, I'm not quite sure what their solution to that that was. Um, but it, it did seem to strike a, a bit of a nerve with I, some people in the terms of fairness. I mean, for me, I was like, well, I wouldn't, I feel I'm not as genetically um, gifted as, say, Usain Bolt, but I, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'd, I'd probably <laughs> be disappointed if I was up against him in a, in a hundred meter race, but it doesn't mean that I shouldn't be allowed to compete against him and he shouldn't be allowed to compete against me. I was just like, she just seems to have some genetic advantages. Um, I, I think I think that's um, I think that's a really interesting point and I think that was what I was quite impressed with mm. with well this one child but the rest of the class kind of joined in and, and that um I think the the media debate around or the debate the conversation around Casta Semenya very much focused on um so we divide people into um genders based on their genitals and that's how we and, and that's how we've done it. Yeah. There's this person that actually fits into one of those categories, but we people became upset about that. And the, the, that's quite a nuanced that's quite a nuanced debate. And I, I think you're absolutely right. It wasn't really reported in that way. No, um, not at all. And, but this was something that that, that that these children could pick up on, and that yeah. they kind of mm. were yeah that they understood. Did any of them um, come up with a like a solution? I don't think they, but that's another thing. I don't think they really framed it as a as a kind of a problem. That wasn't mm. something they had picked up on. That yeah. kind of um, the, they had just picked up on. It was something they had observed with someone w with kind of sexual characteristics that didn't fit into the binary. That mm. was a kind of example that they gave, rather than kind of framing it in the same way that I think perhaps had been re reported. So it was a much more kind of nuanced. Um, uh, understanding than I think a lot of people who kind of followed it in the news had taken away from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because um, I mean, are we going off topic? That's totally sweet. <laughs> but um, <coughs> the Olympics, especially, um, essentially, you're just trying to force people into two categories, mm. no matter how varied or on a spectrum they are. You, you like right. Penises over there, <laughs> vulvas over here. That's 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 yeah. it. It's it's two categories. Yeah. And they they don't. Comp I mean, if that is potentially the ultimate problem where you'd start to unpick them. I think I yeah, know. and I think it's it's really interesting that that's. I mean, that's essentially how we <laughs> divide people up in a, a lot of areas mm. yeah. um, in our life. Um, it a, again, um, you kind of initially mm. asked what kind of surprised me is how easy it can be to get children to notice these things a lot of the time so we often talk about why well, often talk about um school uniforms mm. when we're talking about uh, kind of gender expression and gender identity um and sometimes they can come up with things that are quite challenge i think quite challenging to the the school mm. system and to their teachers sometimes yeah. because um again that's a kind of uh kind of arena where we've, we've divided people up um based mm. on the genitals <laughs> and now it's the norm and yeah, mm. yeah absolutely scary to poke that yeah. What all kind of things do they say about school uniform? Um, oh my so god, let's <laughs> smash the patriarchy! Well, great. just just the, so so um, just before Christmas, um, we uh, so we we have a so one of our, our kind of sessions we we do quite a lot is on um, sort of gender identity, and we look at kind of different aspects of gender. So we look at kind of um, so your sort of sexual characteristics um, and gender mm -hmm. identity and gender expression and kind of um, sexuality as well. Um, so sort of different aspects um, and we talk about how they're not necessarily kind of linked to each other and we make a lot of assumptions about you're either a man or a woman and you're you we sort of make a lot of assumptions in society about you being heterosexual and about you mm. having a gender expression that fits very rigidly with that and then often particularly when we're talking about gender expression um, school uniform policies are quite a good way of kind of getting them 
involved with that because often they are wearing uniforms and that, that those codes will be different for um, boys and girls. Um, and I was at a school just before Christmas where um, one of the children said, oh, I... Um, one of the things I've noticed at my school, so um, only girls can wear skirts. We can wear skirts or, or trousers, but if we wear skirts, they have to be a certain length. They have to be quite long. And um, uh, basically, we all have to we all have to buy skirts that we wouldn't we wouldn't wear normally. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, I think the reason. And then 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 this child added, I think the reason is that a lot of the I can't remember the word she used. It w wasn't but to kind of paraphrase um but all the kind of senior staff are, are, are men and i feel that that's kind of them that that's why they've decided to do that mm -hmm. so that was quite a <laughs> that was quite a kind of interesting kind of segue into sort of like gender imbalance mm. and power and yeah. um where people think the focus is and um there was um a male teacher in the room who got was i think was quite challenged by that and actually kind of piped usually the teachers kind of sit at the back of the room <laughs> and um kind of don't want to engage with us no. and kind of sit, yeah they tend to do marking <laughs> furiously um avoid all eye contact but he kind of looked up from from his pile of um i think he was a languages teacher and and was sort of saying well that's that's not true because uh, mrs so-and-so is a, is one of the senior teachers and and i think was obviously and, and it was interesting to have it was good to have him kind of join in the debate and it was good to kind of get that but I think it was quite interesting that his first reaction to this kind of someone to one of the children expressing a kind of uh, this something that she'd observed was to kind of challenge that I think that was really interesting yeah that is interesting and now this At Barbarella's, a gruesome discovery is made. Move alert. Move alert. Contorta, alert. are you all right? Move alert. I am flourishing. My client, not so much. They no longer appear to be living. Flawed. What happened? I am at a loss. One moment we were engaged in a spirited visceral liaison. The next, they let out a perosian expletive and down they go. Not in any gratifying sense. Can I see the body? I better put this on. Perosians start to decompose instantly and give off pure phosgene. Right. Mm, not so much a body as a puddle. It gets worse. Thrill me. Before we started, they boasted they were first offspring to the Pyrrhosian Hyluminan. The Pyrrhosians are the most paranoid species in the cosmos. If this gets out, they'll assume Barbarella's has declared war on them. Ah, oh, relief. I thought I wasn't going to get paid. I will inform Le Grip. You must tell no one, Contorta. If this gets out, they'll use Elbow Vendor as airbrake. Welcome to Full Frontal Newsity, jamming a stick in the spokes of the news cycle. I'm your host, Syncrity Flob, leading the news. Despite their distinction in that department, Barbarellas just can't seem to keep their heads down. Yes, fresh from the Bodo Felcher misappropriated funds fiasco, Virgo's preeminent sexual therapy centre is in hot water yet again, with reports seeping out about the death of a high-ranking Perossian while in the saddle. Given the Perossian reputation for being long on paranoia and short on fuse, don't expect them to take this lying down. Crossing now, live to our on-the-spot news vulture, Gretzka Ab Inter. What have you got for us, Gretzka? Well, Zingriti, Barbarellas has released a statement saying, The Perossian in question signed the standard indemnity waiver and was also cautioned against a therapy session with Contorta Valare as he was clearly out of condition. The Perossians say this is an egregious assault on the integrity and galactic structure of Perossia, its people and its history, which must be met with a response of unparalleled ferocity. That's pretty strong stuff, Gretzka. Well, if you saw Contorta Valera, you'd probably... No, the Perossians. Oh, they've blown smoke before. They're all cape and no codpiece. Back to you. 
Thank you, Greta. As it unfolds, we'll be giving this story all the squalid innuendo it deserves. But next on Full Frontal, teleportation mix-up sees bridal party materialize in pit of Tithra mud scorpions. Not the reception they were expecting. Stay tuned. And now, to more weapons-grade content. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, and I'm sure that... Um healthy relationships um, covers it or, or at least goes near it is um, a sort of focus on any of, um, on pleasure in any of this mm. um, do you do you go near yeah that absolutely. With, with the kids do I they does it all that kind of organically kind of become part of the yeah we tend yeah. to get lots and lots of questions about pleasure which I think is is great um, we tend to cover it more alongside anatomy okay. so when we're talking about anatomy we're talking about bodies and um, I think it's important to cover it um, as part of anatomy um, as possibly as well as other programs and not just healthy relationships because obviously I think pleasure is all about kind of the person, the individual um, and how they define it as opposed to kind of, you know, necessarily um, associated with any kind of relationship. So yeah, I think yeah, it's really yeah. important mm -hmm. that we sort of differentiate that. Um, so, yeah, you know, during when we're talking about anatomy, we talk about kind of uh, definitions of pleasure um, and kind of, you know, we, why we shouldn't res restrict that and kind of, you know, what pleasure is and masturbation is and that it's kind of a personal and private definition and kind of how we explore our bodies in a healthy way. And then we like to talk about masturbation and we talk about... Um, how natural and healthy it is, particularly for mental health, mm. but also, you know, comparing it to the um, animals as well. So, for example, all <laughs> animals masturbate, and we'll talk about camels and how they sort of masturbate into the sand, <laughs> or, you know, like how like dolphins sort of like masturbate all over each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, or like, so, for example, chimpanzees, they sort of yeah. are very, very creative in the tools they use to masturbate with. Um, I think it's crabs. I thought remember um, one of my <laughs> colleagues... Um, uh, it's uh, Matty Brindle. She's studying um, at UCL, doing a PhD in masturbation in primates. Mm. Um, and she showed me a video with a where a champ chimpanzee uses a crab to masturbate with. Ouchies. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think all of this just really helps us break down taboos and sort of also address like why is masturbation um, so taboo? Like w where did that kind of start from? And mm. like why is it healthy? Why is it really important? Yeah. yeah, I think it would be quite dishonest to have mm. a, a kind of <laughs> sex less like sex ed without mm. um, touching on pleasure at all. Yeah. Um, I think that was like looking back to my own kind of sex ed. I think that was what was kind of missing. There was a lot of I think it was all right in terms of kind of technical stuff like here's the contraception you can use. Uh, yeah, I uh, was well. Yeah, so from that <laughs> point of view, but I think I, I think um, you're not. If you're not kind of addressing like why people have sex and why it's such a kind of like powerful urge, I think I think that's quite a dishonest yeah. um, mm. portrait yeah, totally. to be giving. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and just talking about, as I said before, um, you know, like pleasure definitions of pleasure, and how we tend to have uh, quite a, sometimes quite a heteronormative um, association with pleasure, um, and it's kind mm. of. Uh, usually th seen through like a, a male uh, heteronormative lens um how it's kind of really important to sort of break that down um and like i guess redefine it uh, yeah yeah do you think that um that younger people are more are more sort of receptive or open to to those ideas uh, sort of moving away from sort mm. of heteronormative things and stuff like that because I don't know. I've struggled with some older older relatives, <laughs> should I say, um, who who just can't quite they're kind of like what can't get their head around it. So you know, if you've got a, do you find that young kids are, are easier to mould, or are they already there? Are they already I think ahead? Yes or no? I I don't think it's a question of um, moulding people to be more receptive to no. kind of other experiences. I think it's more the other way. I think we're, um, um, I think, I think this kind of like idea of what sexuality, this very heteronormative kind of historical idea of what sexuality is, has been molded on us through mm. kind of history and through kind of social conditioning. Um, so for example, um, I I can't remember, like I can't really, oh I can. So I, I never really saw relationships um, outside, like 
that weren't heterosexual until I was like a, well into my teens, I think. Um, and when I say I didn't see them, I mean I didn't, I wasn't aware of them. Not that they weren't there. So I, I used to go to um, a youth a, a youth group, and I remember one of my friends from my youth group had two mums. And I was like, isn't, and, and I remember, such an idiot, internally, I remember <laughs> thinking, isn't it nice that those two women like live together and have raised their family together? And I didn't really, like they were a couple and I just didn't like think of them in that way um, because they were two women. And to me, that's not what t like a relationship looked like. And that was, and I, and I grew up in a very like liberal North London lefty home. Like I, like, but just to me, I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that person's two mummies uh, must have yeah I, I thought I thought they were husbands somewhere I, right. I don't know what kind of stuff but yeah um so um, in a cupboard somewhere yeah, <laughs> yeah. um so um getting back to you like I don't think it's that we're kind of like molding or recepting trying I don't think it's about molding young people to us to to kind of um something that isn't there already mm. I think it's about kind of like just kind of getting rid of this kind of hegemony of this is what a relationship looks like this is what how you have to be behave and this is this is what you have to do yeah um yeah did sex blame kind of grow from a lack of something or did you did you sort of see like oh this is something i wished i would have uh would have had when I was younger. Yeah. So, um, uh, well, I mean, to begin, Sex Plane actually um, started. Um, Hazel and Amelia um, started uh, Sex Plane, and um, it was when during a master's project they were into doing lots of focus groups with young people about school uniforms. Actually, yeah. Um, and when the cameras kind of stopped recording, um, they heard lots of um, kind of. Um, uh, stories by young people um, and girls in particular who were being catcalled in their school uniform who were kind of told that their blouses were too um, see-through or their sh uh, the skirts were too short and were distracting boys and teachers and that you know for example that they would um, hold keys in their hands and run at home once they got off the bus but also you know how y gender uh, like kind of non-binary young people found uh, uniform to be such a huge issue for them mm. and um, you know how it was it was kind of quite hurtful that the, you know they weren't being listened to or um, it being addressed and um, they also spoke to Professor Jessica Ringrose um, about kind of digital uh, issues um, and kind of dick pics unsolicited dick pics yeah, yeah. and um, the issues around there and kind of just a general lack of support for young people um, and how important it was for this to be discussed within sex education and uh, yeah, that's why kind of sex was started right. to um, provide comprehensive um, sex ed and to support young people um, and to tackle things like victim blaming and um, stop young people to, you know, for example, even um, when someone uh, sends a nude, for example, and that is shared unconsensually, mm. uh, that is sexual violence and it's a crime. Um, and it's really important to show support for young people, um, you know, if that is something that's happened to them. Um, a little bit like in sex education, you know, where, yeah, in, I don't know if you've seen the episode where kind oh, of yeah. everyone stands up and <laughs> says, it's my vagina. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember what episode it is. Possibly I episode five. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. But Brilliant. again, you know, <laughs> it's, it's so important to show support for someone who has... You know, a bit as a, is a survivor of kind of like sexual violence, mm. um, uh, as opposed to um, ha having a sending the message that actually it's their fault in some way. Um, yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you you asked kind of about our kind of sexual yeah. experiences. Yeah, lots um, of liberal so North London. Yeah, so I, so I actually went to a uh, I went to a girls' school, <laughs> um, and it was very it wasn't touched so we had like our psr whatever they were called then but like psre lessons essentially um so where you're meant to get all your kind of like um health and sex ed and uh spir spiritual guidance yeah. as well um and i remember kind of isolated sessions so i, I remember looking at through like a pack of contraceptives um like a, a kind of pack of cards of of like con what con what different contraceptives did um, and that was that. That's pretty much all I can remember. Oh, I can remember costing how much a baby it would have up, how much it would 
be to have a oh, baby yeah. as well. Yeah. Like basically, I think as a like a auntie, don't don't have children, kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, wait until you're older. Um, it costs so much. Yeah, it costs so much. Um, yeah, that was. <laughs> they do cost a lot. <laughs> um, and that was and that was kind of it. And I I think I feel like it was missing a lot of context and content. It, there were a lot of assumptions that I. I haven't really unpacked, like, I I don't think fully even now, but things like, so sex is penis in vagina sex and um, it's a man and a woman. The the problem with sex, and and I think I feel it was phrased as a problem, is you might get pregnant um, and here are ways you can stop getting pregnant. Um, Yeah, which, and I, yeah, and I think, yeah. Now go away and... Don't do it. Don't, yeah, yeah. Kind, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. I also feel, um, I think, um, I, so I got involved in um, Sex Blame when I had, just after I'd qualified as a doctor, and I feel like a lot of the, I feel like a lot of the messages that we present to young people, to, to a lot of people, but particularly uh, um, to young people in sex that are quite disingenuous in terms of like how they match up with the clinical knowledge so um you tell young people about all the different types of contraception that are available um but you don't which is uh, except they're not all available and they're not all like uh you know and i think it's good to tell um um i think it's good to tell young people about it, about about everything and, and so they, they have more knowledge but you you, you don't kind of or oh, we didn't kind of talk about like, well, pretty much young people that they use condoms or they might um, they might use if they've got a uterus, they might use um, kind of hormonal contraceptives if they've got a particularly kind of um, right on GP that kind of facilitates that. Yeah. But, and it's kind of, yeah, it's sort of disingenuous. The messages that you kind of get given, oh, you can choose any of these things. And you don't really kind of talk about well, what, what, but that's that's probably not what you're going to do. And why might you choose this over this? Mm. And, yeah, yeah. So really not tailored for the age group or the kind of where they're at, basically. Yeah, kind of experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah where they're at and experiences. And, and yeah, like I don't think... Like one of the quite basic things we, we talk about is that we talk about that contraceptives are different from protection and they have different functions. And we talk quite a lot about mm. condoms and why... Um, y- yeah, why like why they're incredibly common, particularly for young people... Um, or why they're mo- most often used is is to do with they have these kind of like dual purposes, and I think that's that's a message that was I think like I think that was really missing from my sex ed that yeah how things kind of act, actually work. Mm. Yeah, because it's not just a nice little conveyor belt of yeah all the <laughs> contraception you would ever want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I found similarly actually my sex ed was very clinical. It was um it but in the sense that it was very much just about reproduction mm. and, and that's kind of it really mm. um you know nothing on on periods or a pleasure uh, definitely not and you know i remember um being told that it was kind of pretty much pointless to be bisexual or a lesbian um Point which was out. which was great <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to hear as a, as a queer <laughs> a woman of color um yeah it was it was um it was a really difficult one, actually. It was a really um, kind of growing up. I luckily then went to a, a college afterwards and met lots of like wonderful queer people who educated me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so that was like fantastic. But it was, yeah, quite um, quite an upsetting time, I think, um, just not being able to just get not given that sort of space mm. to be who I who I am. Yeah, mm. no, I mean it's, it's it's such a common story, um, and why sex plane is. Is such a good idea. I mean, how how is it received kind of across the board um, by parents? Mm-hmm. And I mean, d- do you approach schools or do they mm-hmm. approach you? Is it is it a common knowledge that 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 sex education is is lacking like drastically? And actually, something like explain sex plan is filling this gap, or is sex education actually coming up to meet the challenge and kind of? You know, you're laughing like it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, again, I think it's I think it's tricky because it really depends um, on on the school. But 
Um, I mean, obviously, with the um, mandatory sex ed guidance coming in in September 2020, where, um, you know, it's mandatory for schools to deliver, secondary schools to deliver um, uh, relationship and sex ed. And I think I think that has kind of encouraged um, more people to seek out sex ed, like comprehensive and inclusive. But generally, when, you know, we speak to people, we always mm. find um, similar sort of ser- stories about poor sex ed and how important it is to um, receive comprehensive, inclusive um, uh, relationship and sex ed. Um, but again, I think, you know, generally the uh, response has been very positive. Um, but I think we really value the opportunity to talk to parents um, one-on-one mm. um, where we can talk about the type of sex ed that young people are receiving and how it's age appropriate and you know why it's relevant and how it's ultimately the goal is to create a healthy happy safe place for someone to grow up and be who they are Mm. um and i definitely think that once you've had that open discussion it really has an impact and it's not just Mm. something that they're reading on the newspaper or kind of random stories and rumors that are just spreading that people are hearing and you've you've got this honest dialogue open yeah. dialogue with the school and uh, parents yeah mm. now that seems um like bang on i mean there was something i only got it because it the new story mm. did make its way mm. to new zealand about a british <laughs> school where there were some people protesting about some aspects of sex education oh, so and they Birmingham. weren't yeah, yeah they they just yeah. weren't it might have been from a religious um religious sort of perspective um, but it was basically what they were saying was they were never asked. So I think that was a really interesting... So it was just before... So the curriculum has, um, I think, is, is in effect from 2020, but mm-hmm. um, is kind September, of... September, yeah. Yeah, but kind of, um, like, it has been around and and, mm. and, and, and kind of you can teach from it mm. um, um, for, for a little while. And um, I think you're talking about the Birmingham protest... I think so, ...against yeah. the No Outsiders project... Um, and I think that was a um, so the the No Outsiders project. My understanding is that um, it was a, a particular um, a, a, a teacher specifically set up a kind of I think it was framed as a kind of anti bullying project, mm, yeah, um, and used kind of literature based. It was much younger children, um, and it was a and there were like a a, a, a range of books um, that were meant to just show um, like. Di- a diversity of people like mm-hmm. it wasn't necessarily um kind of lgbt content although some of the books explicitly were um i believe the teacher that started it up is a, is a gay man um and kind of felt that was really important because he like his family didn't look like like he had never been shown images of what his family looked like when he was kind of growing up um and um yeah i think there were some protests um there were some protests um, a- around that because, specifically, because of the the books they because of, of some of the books um, having kind of LGBT content. There was, um, I think, there's a book called um, M- is it Mama, Mama, Mummy and Me, mm. um, things like that. Um, and the the um, and Tango makes three. I don't know if you've come across that. <laughs> no. um, it's about the, the gay penguins in New York, New, uh, New York uh, Zoo. Uh, the, the, this was a, a few years ago. Anyway, it's been made into a children. It's been serialized as a children's book. Of course. Great. Um, so it was about uh, there were uh, two penguins, so two male penguins um, that kind of mated and, and lived as a kind of couple in uh, in uh, New York Zoo, um, which I think caused protests in itself. <laughs> of course it did. And then um, they had like a, a kind of orphan egg, which they were given, and they kind of um, developed like parental... Like, so they, they yeah, they um, raised this chick as as if they were a couple and well, as, as a couple, and um, a lot of the kind of um, like family bonds and behaviour was exactly the same as you get with a kind of male-female pair. Um, and again, this <laughs> caused... But anyway, th- so this was written to a book. This is one of the books. These are all children's stories. They're yeah. very, like, age-appropriate to very <laughs> young children. Um, one of the books is... Uh, it's not just about LGBT content. One of the books was Elmer the Elephant. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think because there were just... Because there were... Um, the because there were gay relationships shown in some of the books, or, like, non-heterosexual relationships shown in some of the books, um, yeah, it was protested... Um, you said that it was. You felt that it was a religious thing. I, I don't feel that it has been. I think it's no. been portrayed. I don't think it was. That's what the media. I probably think mean. some of the some of the parents um, were from certain religions, and they 
kind of used that as their argument at saying I'm I'm protesting this because it's against my religion, and I think that was really picked up by the media, yeah, and it was yeah. it was kind of phrased as um, this religious group is protesting this, and I, I don't really I don't feel that's authentic to what was going on. Mm. I think I think it is much more accurate to say that um, a group of parents, I think of different I think of different faiths if you really d- drill down to it, though perhaps some more from certain faiths because yeah. Um, possibly just to do with the makeup of where the school was, and I think that was that was the the kind of narrative that was seized mm, on by yeah. the media. Mm. And I think it f- because I think we we like kind of easy debates, and it was easy to say this is um, th- this is religious parents fighting for mm. their like against the kind of liberal like yeah, who who would win, and it, it wasn't. I, I I don't feel that that's quite what was going mm. on. No, no, I wouldn't be surprised okay. to <laughs> by the time. News from Birmingham gets to New Zealand. <laughs> um, it can have gone through a plethora of filters <laughs> to make it clickable. Just a quick reminder to head on over to our website at sexinspace.com or our Insta at sexinspace.com and fill in our lovely little survey. We'd really, 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 really appreciate it. It's very interesting. Is there anything like, that, um, like for both of you, shifts that that you you've made or um, since sort of being not not just involved with sort of sex pain, but like your biggest kind of learnings from all from all of this or. I think for me it's been a lot like like loads. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the biggest ones is just how you so I think I've talked quite a lot about how there's a lot of assumptions are made and a lot of kind of social constructs around kind of like gender and sexuality um and and what that should look like and I think it's really it's made me incredibly reflective about how um yeah how you how I might be doing that myself and I think I do and I think I certainly Mm. did um so one of the things was um I think I I refer to people as as guys a lot Mm. or used to and like that's been so working with sex plane has made has made me like go out and and like try and learn a bit more and and as well as being reflective and um I I came across something where someone says that that's that's quite a gendered thing and to to pretend it isn't um is is like is is not really isn't like is not really a thing yeah um and i think that i've stopped doing things like that and i've just just, yeah it's it's made me really think about how i kind of interact with the world and what Mm. messages i might be putting out i think Mm. Mm. that's awesome yeah i think um again like like you said emma i've feel like i've learned so much um and i I feel like i constantly am to be working with young people um but for me, you know, learning about intersex, but also learning, you know, uh, the, the virginity myth is like so important and mm. so, um, so it's had such a huge impact on um, misogyny mm. as well. Um, and Give it's really a, sorry to jump in there. Give right. us a breakdown <laughs> of that because um, I'm not I'm not per- perfectly familiar with it. The so virginity it, myth. I've heard. I've heard a rumor of this myth. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's just the idea of kind of what we have a very um, we have a very enduring idea of what virginity is. So lo- losing your virginity is the the first time that you have sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and but what what do we mean by that? And and it's kind of an assumption that we mean like penis in vagina sex. Yeah. So penetrative penis in vagina sex. That's but like lots of people never have that. Does mm-hmm. that mean they're virgins? I was like, of course not. So it's it's a kind of it's a social construct, and it's, but that's that's a yeah. I think that's, but it's quite difficult to get your head around that. I think mm. well, for me it was. Mm. Oh, yeah. You, I suppose there's a value attributed to it as well. Yeah, like yeah, and a lot of yeah, yeah, and I think tying it in with like to the point where we tie it in with, like biological stuff that isn't true so um i think when i was quite i think i've told you this before donnie <laughs> when i was um quite new to sex i was in the pub talking to friends um about um 
about sex brain and some stuff we were doing and um i mentioned like we'd been i'd been to a workshop and like with with sex brain and we were talking about like that and i sort of mentioned oh you know th- that people that all these things persist like that the hymen like being a real thing mm. <laughs> like that that kind of like a covering for the vagina that kind of persists and one of my friends um actually who who has a biology degree kind of was like oh yes but of course that's true like the 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 hymen is a is a bit of tissue that covers the vagina and like was quite resistant oh yeah was quite resistant to the idea that that was yeah that that was a kind of a myth that persists that yeah mm. right so if 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 that's a, i mean i believe you that's a myth <laughs> um what a what a say doctors check on i mean um Sure, in certain. Do you mean certain, for like virginity tests? Yeah. Oh, so they're they're not a thing. Yeah. They're not even so, a thing. So no, the hymen. I, I assume probably. So weren't. so the hymen is is kind of um, tissue that surrounds the entrance to the vagina. Mm. Um, I think there's some moves to call it like um, the kind of vaginal corona mm. rather than the hymen because the hymen's so linked into this idea that there is a covering over the vagina, um, and a, a, a virgin girl. Um, has this covering until it's pierced by a penis and then they've lost their virginity. Nothing um, else can get through. Uh, nothing else <laughs> no, can. Just but that's penis, it. Yeah. Like you've got like, but and, and you kind of ignore your own, like your own, un- like your own, like I think a lot of um, cis women ignore their own like biological experience, like their own experiences. So like, you know, you have a period and you know that like before you, ha- you like most people have periods before they have sex. Most people have discharge mm. and you kind of, yeah, you sort mm. of, ignore those experiences and like oh no but the, the hymen is definitely a thing yeah. um, <laughs> and um, yeah um, so, so virginity tests are not like and you can find a lot of documented experience of this is how you do it but they're not they're not really a thing um, you shouldn't have to bleed the first time mm. someone with a vulva has um, penetrative sex with either a penis or mm. a toy or anything it, it shouldn't have to bleed or hurt and I th- and, and if it does it's 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 not because you're breaking any kind of seal. It's because um, it's it's probably more, more likely to be tra- traumatic sex. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah. And so yeah. the definition of virginity is basically out. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah. But and so, it, but but your first sexual experience, whatever that that may be, with yourself or with mm. a mm-hmm. partner, are people. Move like would the goalposts move to that? Um, I don't really know what I'm asking actually. Well, I think I, for I lo- when I was younger, I was like, "Have you lost it yet?" You know? <laughs> um, or you know, you sort of chasing chasing that kind of line in the sand or something. I suppose as, as a young person, that's what I remember anyway. Um, so yeah, if the goalposts suddenly shift, do I need to reassess my? I think, Timeline. I think again, I think it's a, something that for a lot of people they understand it. So I have, um, I have a, a friend who's a lesbian. She's married to a woman. She's never had um, a, like penetrative penis, penile sex. Um, we're, we're close enough that I know yeah. that. Um, <laughs> but she, um, she goes, she goes to her doctor, and and um, she's like often. Like she's been asked, like, oh, so you're a virgin then? When she kind of explains her like her sexual history, and she's like, no, no. <laughs> heavens no. <laughs> um, and I think, like, so my friend knows that that's like for her, it's so obvious that she has lost her virginity, or <laughs> this this kind of idea of virginity has like she doesn't like, but like it's very clear to her. So it's I guess when you say moving the goalposts, I guess if you're talking about kind of like what we see as that we accept each other's kind of shared standards, I think mm. that's, I think that's likely to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it's basically the concept of virginity is gone and it's a, uh, it's just when you become personal s- definition, sexually yeah. active. Pers- yeah. Personally, yeah. I guess yeah, it's personal something. definitions mm. for a lot of people. Yeah. Like that is, that is quite like, I, I think for a lot of people that is quite. Um, like you, you talked about you and your friends, like, no. <laughs> yeah. like I think it is an important thing for some people, and that's fine. And you can, and I think that's a lot of a lot of the changes we, and a lot of the change we try to affect. You can still have your thing. You can still be mm. like a straight cis man. <laughs> like that's fine. You can still say you've lost your virginity if that's what it feels authentic to you. Like that's we're not taking this away. It's about mm. trying to um, 
it's about trying to recognise that other people's experiences are maybe different from yours and are completely valid. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. So I think we, we will shift the goalposts of, accept, of uh, yeah, accepting mm. definitions. Oh, well, I, I think but, it's... But I kind think of recognising them, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's great because um, a bit of personal story, I didn't have sex with my first girlfriend mm. and we were together for about about a year. Mm. Um, and f- am- amongst my friends, we were doing other things. Um, but amongst my friends group, they were just like, have you done it yet? 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 And I was just like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and I might have, did I lie? Did I say we had at some point? I don't remember. It was a long time ago. But um, it was a thing, mm. you know. We mm. were not, I was we've made fun of for not mm. having had sex. Mm. Um, so, yeah interesting but at the same time we were sexually active so mm. I, like, I like the idea of it being yeah. a, of a more personal personal thing yeah possibly someone's first orgasm but then again maybe that restricts our definitions of pleasure yeah I think yeah. we sort of we sort of define when we talk about sex as being anything that kind of makes you feel aroused or yes. horny mm. um, so if you're looking at virginity as a kind of social construct with the first time that you have sex, that's that's a very personal, mm. yeah, that's a very personal yeah. thing. Yeah. I tell you, it's interesting <laughs> now that I'm a parent, um, mm. it's interesting as you sort of think forward about, you know, oh, what what do I want for my daughter and how much responsibility am I prepared to take for her sex education? Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Um and I would never want to just be hands off and mm. lumber all the school with, okay, you tell mm. her everything she needs to know, that kind of thing. But it's interesting to know that there are things like sex plane around and that schools are receptive to that mm. and they acknowledge that, you know, there's a gap in the curriculum. Um, I think that's really, it's good. And in hopefully, how old is she? She's four. <laughs> When should I really start worrying? <laughs> right now. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Yeah, but I think yeah. I think that's a good point. I think it's um, really important for, you know, uh, parents to kind of build, as I said before, it's a, it should be holistic. And mm. it's, you know, that the foundations can be sort of um, built upon by schools. Um, and, you know, talking to um, children about their bodies and, you know, using correct names like Evolver mm. and... Um, and just kind of being quite, uh, I guess, normal and fun about it all. And it really helps to remove stigma um, so that, you know, when they do go into school, things, these are things that they just feel quite normal talking about. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, and I think a really important thing is to be kind of respe- receptive. Um, I think as a parent is mm. to be receptive. Um, so um, one of the... Um, one, uh, someone that works uh, with us, Susie Bolton, who um, set up um, Teaching the Talk. Um, so she was, um, uh, she is, uh, she's, she's gone off to university now, but she, um, a, a, for the last sort of year or so, mm. um, has been trying, trying to get um young people involved and kind of like feeding back on what we do. And so that it's kind of, so that young people have an input into what we do. Mm. Um, and um, Susie talks quite a lot about how, um, it's like it's important to have good relationships with your parents, but also, um, like like children are, are entitled to a sex life mm. it's, that's private, and it, and it is something that's quite private. And mm. it's it's I think a lot of I think a lot of parents c- have had bad sex ed experiences, mm. and sort of f- particularly through formal education, and kind of try and compensate by that with oh I'll be your best friend and we'll tell each other all our sex stories. And I think for a lot of relationships that's not really appropriate. Yeah, not at all. Um, so I think it's about yeah having like 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 respecting if if your child wants like boundaries and privacy, like absolutely respecting that, but also mm. being kind of open to if they have questions. Mm. Yeah. Just a slight aside, something you said about the correct terminology mm. for genitalia. Mm. Um, I think there was a story out of New Zealand um, that was going around the kindergarten scene, mm. and it was like um, there was a little girl who had been abused, and nobody picked up on it for, mm. I think, about a week um, because she wasn't using. They didn't understand what she was saying. Mm. So she said that she had a sore Pikachu, I think. Right. 
and they thought she was talking about her teddy bear. Mm. And so they were like, oh, you poor teddy, da 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 And it transpired that she was being abused. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to tell her that she had a sore, sore genitals. Um, mm. And so that, that became an, an interesting sort of wake-up call because I think we'd already started, you know... For JJ or Jiny or something like that, so we've, yeah, you know, yeah, ah, slam on the brakes on that. <laughs> and but no, that's that's interesting, and for other people as well. Like, to uh, I didn't, I think I'd heard before about about using the correct terminology for mm. genitals, but I didn't really understand why. And then that story, I heard that story, and I was like, oh yeah, that's mm. perfectly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've heard it kind of said um, that if you like, how are you meant to tell people that someone's inappropriately touching you if you have no words mm. for mm. those kind of body parts? And I think that's something that's, I think that's something that's quite specific to um, people with vulvas. I think mm. um, I think we tend to be very com- we have loads of terms like I don't know PP or whatever like mm. for the the young children know mm. for kind of penis and testicles, but we don't. Yeah, mm. we tend to less so for people with vulvas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I Pikachu is, you know, <laughs> but, but that, yeah. that doesn't seem yeah. particularly like a far stretch that, yeah. that somebody mm-hmm. might, might call yeah, it Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's important for medical and obviously safeguarding reasons, but also just because, you know, that it's, it's something as simple as, you know, people have a right to know what their bodies are and mm. what they're called. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. And, you know, we should just shouldn't shy away from using the right words. Absolutely. I think. Do you encourage kids to investigate yeah yeah absolutely yeah Yeah, just uh, again you know not just um related to pleasure but just getting to know their own bodies and what's normal for their own bodies and that's why i say Mm. emma so that you know obviously understanding what's normal for your body so that if anything does feel kind of abnormal or wrong then see a doctor Mm. as soon as possible Mm. i think we talk about things like discharge and Mm. um kind of um yeah all sorts of um and like if it's abnormal kind of go and see a doctor but yeah i think a lot of times people don't really know what's normal for them um another another um kind of thing that i've picked up on a lot through so we we do anatomy um kind of genital anatomy sessions quite a lot um and um we kind of we we build a play-doh vulva (laughs) yeah um and um when we do that, we kind of build the different bits of the vulva. So we build the kind of vagina and the um, urethra, but we also build like the kind of um, labia majora and labia minora, so the, the kind of protective kind of bits. Um, and you kind of talk about like the lab, one of the big things we always emphasize is that with the labia minora, so the kind of slightly tissue that's slightly um, inside of the labia majora is that it, it can be quite big and it can mm. be quite protrusive and, but you don't really see that on porn ever mm. um, and the number of people that are disgusted by it is, mm. is interesting because if they're kind of going on their own bodies a lot of people must have this anatomy so about, mm. about half of people with, with vulvas have kind of quite prominent um, labia minora um, so some of the people that are kind of going it, it, that, like just just Statistics says that some of them that must be what mm. their bodies look like. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's to sort of distance themselves, isn't it, from it? Yeah. Um, but again, you know, when you so we use like lots of like kind of beautiful illustrations and things to sort of help us discuss um, uh, specific aspects. For example, you know, vulvas and labia uh, minora. And you know, when you go into detail and you talk about you know why this is normal and you know, um, why do, why does it look different and why don't we kind of know about that? Why do we, why are we saying, uh, and when you sort of have that discussion, it's really nice to see the shift in attitudes, I think, um, in young people. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, if, if you want Sex Plane to come to your school. Yeah. Um, that's something that people can contact you about? Yeah, please yeah. do, yeah, not, not f- The school doesn't have to get in contact, the, the students could potentially yeah definitely start that conversation going yeah that's great yeah. um yeah we've had lots of um people kind of follow us on instagram who uh, sort of message us and say they like our work yeah. and um we've worked with lots of young people to support them in like creating um i guess feminist groups or lgbtq societies mm. within their schools um so yeah whatever uh, whoever wants to kind of contact us can yeah <laughs> yeah okay cool yeah all right then so you're not it's not a there's not a strict channel no, with no. which way to you know to get you guys to come to a school and you're across the UK yeah that's right yeah, yeah absolutely um reaching more up to uh, up north and uh, the midlands more so over the next 
over the next year. Awesome. But yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's really exciting. <laughs> yeah. And a plethora of facilitators. It's not it's not just you two running about. Um, no. <laughs> no, God, thankfully not. Um, I think I'd um, fall down. How many um, people do you have? Um, so we have around 10 facilitators who are kind of on varying levels of kind of engagement uh, depending on kind of things that they're doing. Um, and again, they will go out and uh, deliver workshops uh, to different schools. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, guys. Perfect. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Really hope you enjoyed that. If you want more of Dolly, Emma and the other great people over at the uh, School of Sexuality Education, you can check out their website at schoolofsexed.org or you can stalk them on Instagram and argue with them on Twitter at school underscore sex ed. Last but not least, you can email them at info at schoolofsexed.org. If you enjoyed this podcast and fancied leaving us a five-star rating or a cheeky little review on Apple Podcasts, that'd be really great. You know, you could use it as a sort of secret message board to someone special. I'll read out anything you put in there. I'm like Ron Burgundy in that way. Massive, massive thanks to all our great guests. The guy whose name escapes me at Outset Studios in London Bridge. To the team at String Theory. And to Andrew, Tanya, Brandon, David and Richard for their amazing voices. Thank you to you for making it all the way to the end. Join me for episode 12 and the final of season one. Catch you later. If you found some of this material a little challenging, keep coming back and we'll make it really challenging.